The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same-game parlays. Find bets in the new Explore tab. Make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays, and more. So, visit FanDuel.com slash 247 and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Must be 21 plus and present in Arizona, Colorado, Connecticut, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, permitted parishes only, Massachusetts, Maryland, Michigan, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, or Wyoming. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700 or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland. Visit 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia or call one 800 522 4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York or visit oasas.ny.gov slash gambling. Standard text messaging rates apply. Sports betting is void in Georgia, Hawaii, Utah, and other states where prohibited. The following is a gopowercat.com and Spirit Street production. discovered your link to gopowercat.com's power cat questions podcast presented by fridge wholesale liquor and it starts right now now let's go to the wtc gig powered studios here's your host gopowercat.com publisher tim fitzgerald welcome to another edition of the power cat questions podcast as we change it up again this week and we take your questions, but it's not the normal trio of people. I am still Tim Fitzgerald, last time I checked, but this week we're joined by Ryan Wallace, our recruiting editor, analyst. I can't remember what title I give you. It's, it's a cool title, Wally, but I can't remember. The, the, the grand czar of football recruiting at gopowercat.com. And we're doing the rare recruiting podcast. We usually save the good stuff, the recruiting stuff for the message boards for our VIP subscribers. But uh, we've got uh, a little opportunity here to give a sample of the expertise that Wally's brought to the market. God, how long have you been coming recruiting for us, Ryan? Oh, I'm, I'm, I think it's at least a decade. I, I think I finally hit the 10-year mark. I, I think I was pitching in a little bit here um, you know, if you go by recruiting classes, maybe 2008 or nine, um, but certainly by 2010. So I, I think it's safe to just call it a decade at this point. And we were podcasting when you arrived, right? Or did you, were you part of starting the podcast? I believe I was one of the original podcasters, if I'm not mistaken, me and Rob Cassidy. Yeah. So that does put us the 10 plus year mark uh, with podcasting. I was talking that with Ryan Abraham the USC publisher, he's been doing it 13 years, and I'm like, well, you got a better memory than I do. It all runs together. We were somewhere in the back of our Aggieville offices with um, half-ass equipment podcasting, handing mics <laughs> And We've come a long ways. It's amazing. I've got this little tiny setup in the home right now since I'm uh, kind of confined for the most part, and it's better set up than we had in the back of the Aggieville offices. So, uh, Yeah, I don't doubt that one for one second. <laughs> we are sponsored by the Fridge Wholesale Liquor. Not a long spiel this week because uh, we've got lots of stuff to get to, but let me tell you, folks, if you're not using the Fridge's app, if you're in Manhattan or the area and you want to shop at the Fridge, it's pretty damn slick. You just get on the app and you plug in what you want. You can pay right there. You pull in the stall. You call them. They bring it right out and put it in your car. You never 
never have to set foot out of your car. And if you're scared of the Rona and seeing other people like Tim Fitzgerald, the app's pretty slick. I pop open the back hatch of my SUV. Alcohol goes in. I drive home. Alcohol comes out, and I'm happy. Get to the fridge whenever you're in town. Football season hopefully is still coming, and you will need the fridge at that time. And uh, I can't imagine what carryout will be like on on football weekends, but just imagine you're driving to Manhattan and you realize, hey, I forgot the beer, I forgot the vodka for the Bloody Marys, I forgot this and that. How, you forgot your mix for the Bloody Marys. Get on the app and plug it in and, and uh, pull in and they'll bring it out to you. It's going to be pretty slick come game day Saturdays in Manhattan. The segment sponsored by Tanners and uh, they are open. They are socially distanced so they can't seat as many as they normally would but if you're in a position to go to restaurants and you're in Manhattan or the area, get down to Tanners. They're great people, great food and I certainly miss the Kansas City burger with the pulled pork and the onion ring and all its healthiness. Yeah, God, why can't I lose weight um, as I eat a Kansas City burger at Tanners with tots on the side. It's one of my favorite things in Manhattan. Wally, we got a bunch of questions from different uh, sources here. We had the thread. Um, the thread was somewhat productive, not overly productive. Um, some people kind of went off in other areas that we're not going to go into today. But we also had questions given to us for the regular podcasts that were better suited for you and then uh, we've got the podcast bank of questions now that we kind of set aside for lean times and there were some good ones in that so my compliments to zach carlson for collecting those and let's just dive right in here with king jim 77 what is the best kansas high school recruiting class you can remember and i am unclear if he's asking in terms of what k-state signed or overall in the entire state but let's take it from that what's the best overall group of recruits you can remember coming out of the state of Kansas? Uh, this is going to be there, – there's a couple different ways, you know, you can look at it, Fitz, because you can look at it strictly from a recruiting standpoint, you know, their value as recruits, or you could look at it as, you know, how did these guys end up panning out. Um, but I like to look at it from just the recruiting standpoint. I, you know, panning out is for, you know, uh, down the road. If we're just talking strictly as recruits – I'm going to be honest. I think 2020 and 2019 are, are you know, strong as we've ever seen, specifically 2020. Um, we're talking Turner Corcoran, um, Kai Thomas, Daniel Jackson, Taylor Warner. I mean, Nate Matlack. Let's, let's think about it this way. Nate Matlack is a fringe top five guy in 2020. Fringe. Um, you put him in virtually any other class in Kansas, and he's – bona fide top three, you know, maybe making contention for the number one spot. But I would probably say 2020. I mean, there have been some others in the past that have been good. 2016 comes to mind. You know, that was Xavier Kelly, Isaiah Simmons, Amani Bledsoe, Mike McCoy was in that class. Tevin Jenkins that started for a number of years. Oklahoma State was in that class. Uh, 2011 was really good at the top. You know, you had Jordan Phillips, uh, Bubba Starling, and Shane Ray, who's gone on to have a successful NFL career. And then I would say 2010 might be forgotten. Um, Blake Bell was a member of that class. Um, Janeo Grissom, Joseph Randall. Um, but even, you know, further down that list, you'll find guys, you know, Trey Walker, Curry Sexton, B.J. Finney. Um, that, was a, that was a quietly, you know, decently good class. Um, but I think, I think if you're looking at it from a recruiting standpoint only, you know, looking at these guys and their value in the recruiting world of high school, I think we're going to look back and I think 2020 is going to be as strong as, as I've ever seen. Well, your point with Nate Matlack really hits home because I, I haven't hidden the fact that I think he's – tremendous a great fit for kansas state now that you've gone out <clears throat> excuse me now that you've gone out and um seen him in person working out with elijah lee and ryan mueller what are you have, have your thoughts been edited a little bit on what nate matlack's about and you think he can have an immediate impact this season for kansas state no i think he can definitely have you know a very very quick impact it, it's funny that he's training with a guy like elijah lee this summer because that's the kind of impact I think we could see him have as a freshman, you know, a situational third down pass rusher. Um, and then, you know, kind of let him come into his own a little bit. You know, I, I think he's good enough where he won't redshirt um, if he ends up carving out a role in that kind of, we used to call it the jet package on third downs with yeah. coach Snyder, but um, 
you know, maybe he does redshirt, but it, the only reason I think at this point from watching Nate both in games and in workouts, the only reason I think uh, it's possible that he could redshirt is simply because they just want to put a little bit more meat on him. And, I mean, he's, he's already 225 and could be 230, you know, after you know a couple months with Chris Dawson. Um, but I could see them saying, you know what, let's hold off. Um, we'll let guys like Boom Massey finish their careers out, um, see what Colin Duke can do in year two, and give Nate some time to really thicken up. But, I mean, he's he's big. I mean, he's bigger than Elijah Lee, both taller, you know, longer, um, moves well. I don't know if he can be a linebacker. Maybe. Um, he practices some of that stuff, but uh, it fits. He's, he's the real deal. I mean, he, he, he is the real deal. Taylor Warner – has that potential. There are other guys in this class that we've talked about back on signing day that have that kind of that that high ceiling. You know, we we both love Carver Willis and Whit Mitchum and those kind of guys. But Nate Matlack is is the real deal. He's the closest thing that I've seen from a high school guy in this class anyway, live and in color. That you know pops off to the point where you're going, yeah, he could play as a freshman. Well, you mentioned Khalid Duke. That does remind me a lot of him and how they used him. I mean, he's, he would come in on that third down rush package that uh, I still call the jet package. I I Don't train me. Uh, give me new tricks to learn. I can't do it. Um, I, but I can see him sliding right into that role. It will be fascinating to see because they did burn Duke's redshirt. I forgot he did play seven games, so mm-hmm. uh, he's a sophomore and. Um, if they'll do the same with Matlack. Yo Mama wants to know, do you see similarities between Matlack and Tanner Wood? I don't. No, not at all. Not not at all. Tanner Tanner was one of those guys that, you know, coming out of high school and especially as he grew at K-State, he was kind of an anchor. You know, he was a guy that would set the edge and kind of, you know, force running backs to get back inside, you know, wasn't the type of guy that was really this quick twitch yeah. pass rusher guy that would frustrate the quarterback. He was just a very, he was an anchor on the D line. Nate Matlack is very much a, you know, pressure the pocket kind of guy. Right. Right. It BP really makes an interesting observation here. He says, I could be mistaken, but is it a coincidence that, or just his style that Chris Kleiman seems to recruit one position heavily at any given time. He recruited many running backs in his first year here. Uh, and, of course, the covered was Bear. But over the last few months, he kept hearing many tight end names on the board and a bunch of receivers committed all at once. Is this by chance or is this kind of by design where they get momentum in a position and they just stock it up at once? I don't know if it's necessarily momentum. I just think those happen to be the areas of the greatest need. And so instead of just finding one guy um, and you know being satisfied with that, I think they try and, you know, they try and get more depth at a position overnight as opposed to over a series of classes. So like last year, they knew that they needed more offensive linemen, specifically offensive tackles. And so they went heavy there. Tight end has been that type of area this year. Although some of that is because they just haven't had as much luck getting some of the tight ends that they've offered in this 2021 class. But, um, you know, they, they look at their needs and they hammer those needs um, to make sure that, you know, on the back end, when it comes time around signing day in the winter, they're not scrambling for guys, but they have what they need at those positions of need. And then they can go out and find kind of the uh, best available guys, uh, you know, to use an NFL draft term. Yeah. Uh, Are they still suffering from the image of the tight end in Snyder 2.0? It seems like they're struggling to recruit a tight end because opposing coaches are still saying, Hey, look, um, Casey didn't throw to the tight end. They never do. You you probably should go somewhere else. I think they need to put it on paper or put it on film that they throw to the tight end more before they have great luck recruiting tight ends. They just couldn't do it last year because of lack of productivity from the position. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely what it is. Uh, they, they want to use the tight end more. Um, but I think really last year they didn't. They didn't really have the guys that I think fit what they want to do. And that also goes back to the offensive line. This offensive line, this upcoming season, is not going to be nearly as experienced, but they're going to be more fitting the mold of what Courtney Messingham and Connor Riley want to do with this offense. They're more athletic. You know, they can get out and really stretch um, the blocks. Um, the group from the past with Coach Snyder was very much, you know, lumbering, ground and pound, just 
lock in on those blocks and try and you know move guys back. Um, so in a way, that they needed offensive linemen to assist with those more stretch blocks, um, and that and that was perfect for a guy like Logan Long and um, Blaze Gammon. That's kind of what they're meant to do. Now that we're going to see more of an athletic offensive line and they finally have the type of style tight ends that, that they want to have with guys like Sammy Wheeler, uh, Briley Moore, uh, Will Swanson, Connor Fox, these guys that uh, will have more of a receiving feel to them, that will come. But, yes, to answer your question long-windedly, they they just ha- they don't have the film to prove it right now. Right, they don't, and I think that'll change, Wally. I think that we're going to see tight ends more involved in this offense now that they're in the second year of running it. I think we'll see a little more diversity. Maybe I'm not sure. Very much so. Yeah. yeah. Email Erica wants to know this: uh, the number of recruits have committed over the last several weeks. What if any major recruits, such as additional four stars, are on the board or likely commits to? Uh, are the sights set on any other Jake Rubleys out there somewhere, or is uh, is this going to be another three star laden class, or or what's going on here? Uh, I, I think for the most part, and we've said this from the beginning. I think you know Chris Kleiman isn't that different of a recruiter than Bill Snyder was, um, and and also in saying that, um, you know, K State just they're never going to land a lot of four and five star guys. You know, even when you had the uh, recruiting sales pitch mastermind car salesman of Ron Prince, uh, you know, that could, you know, we've heard all the stories about, you know, Ron Prince was the type of guy that could sell ice to an Eskimo. And even he wasn't landing a ton of four-star guys. I mean, right. the, the, the fact of the matter is Manhattan is Manhattan and K-State is K-State until you get guys that can come up on visits or until you're, you know, knocking off Oklahoma's and Texas's on a regular basis, you know, the interest level is never going to be there for guys that are at the four star and five star status when they've got, you know, Texas, you know, Alabama, Florida State, what you know, you name it. And then there's K State in there that just doesn't have the the oomph that most of those kid type of kids are really looking for. Um, as far as the twenty twenty one class goes, you know, are there any four star guys out there that um that K State, you know, might have a shot for? Uh currently I don't know. You know, there's there's an offensive lineman named Jordan Moko the, the, from Snow Community College that doesn't hold a ranking from 24-7 yet, um, but it wouldn't surprise me if he was a four-star, and I know he thinks very highly of, of K-State. Um, but, you know, overall, you know, just kind of off the top of my head, it's going to be a more three-star laden group, but that's okay because the type of three stars that we're seeing Chris Kleiman go after is different than we saw coach Snyder target in the sense that a lot of these three stars have fellow power five offers to with their name. Right. Um, they're not these like completely under the radar guys that nobody's ever heard of. I mean, uh, for the most part, they're offering three star guys that, you know, have a following um, from a power five uh, standpoint. And so um, it might not look at, you know, flashy on paper, but um, they're getting some legitimate kids. Uh, I'm, I've been very pleased with the way they've been recruiting. You know, people tend to think three stars are three stars, and that's not true at all. I mean, five stars are very elite. There's a limited number. There's a cap number of those out there. And then four stars are the ones just below them, and and there's not a ton of those. There's more of those than five, but there's not a ton of those. Now, the other end of the spectrum, the two-star guys are people that – just don't show well they you know there's some serious questions about them or people don't know enough about them at this point they weren't seen in camps the film doesn't jump out um and they might end up being good players um but the big connective tissue of all that is the three stars so there's guys closer to four stars and guys closer to two stars all that have the three-star ranking so, um, you know, I think K-State's getting better three stars. You can see it in the recruiting rankings. These are more highly regarded players. Now, whether or not they're productive in the end, we've we've seen that with Coach Snyder that stars don't really matter sometimes. Yeah, I mean, a three-star, from everything that I've always kind of been taught in my mindset, three-star is like you're, you're a bona fide FBS recruit. Um, you know, and that's that's K State. I think for the most part, we've even seen over time three stars become more bona fide Power Five guys. You know, that's that's at least the the 
projection that evaluators are putting on it. Two star, like you said, is more guys that um, maybe have work to do um, from measurable standpoints, um, or yeah, just maybe their film hasn't gotten there yet. That they they're more projects, but th- this idea that three stars are like you know, <laughs> ho hum, um, right. is is wildly incorrect. And for a program like Kansas State, that's who you thrive off of. You you thrive off the guys that maybe haven't physically developed as far yet, and that's a lot of Kansas kids because of the limited uh, time that coaches and trainers can spend with them. Uh, you know, they, they're just a little bit behind the curve. It may not mean when they're a 21-year-old man, they're still behind the curve. And we've seen it over and over. Cody Whitehair. Um, remember when he walked into our office with Curry Sexton yes. and one day? I'll <laughs> yeah. never forget it. I'll never yeah. forget it. I looked at him and like, holy mother of God, this guy is a house. I mean, he was just yeah. built like and, that, but he didn't have the film. He didn't have the exposure. didn't have this and that, and he was a three-star. Yeah, that was that's a great, actually, a great recruiting story, you know, because maybe people don't know, but Shane Howard and I actually cut Curry Sexton's recruiting highlight tape. Um, and so Curry was actually in our office regularly just to kind of check up on the status of things and can he get more copies made that he needed to send to, uh, you know, coaches because that was back in the DVD days, <laughs> you know, free huddle, I think. Um, and yeah, Cody Whitehair, just since they're both Abilene guys, old friends, um, stopped in and we went, wow, this dude is a hoss. Yeah. <laughs> How can we, why is this kid not a four star? Oh, because he lives in Abilene, Kansas. Right. And then a few, a few years later, I'm, at a five-star camp in Baltimore and I'm standing next to the offensive line guys. And I'm like, they're physically impressive, but I still think the most physically impressive high school offensive lineman I've ever seen was Cody white here. That was proven at the college level. And now it's proven at the NFL level as a starter with the bears. So it's, it's funny guys, guys missing, you know, this kind of transitions right into a, a question from Wagcat. How involved can someone in your position get if there's a borderline kid that isn't getting interest? I'm sure you can let KSU know about them, but have you ever felt compelled to reach out to certain schools if you believed enough in a recruit that wasn't getting attention? Maybe let a North Dakota State or a Northern Iowa know a kid was worth a look. I should note here that uh, it is unethical for us to step into the recruiting process in terms of uh, peddling a recruit to other schools, to any school, even K-State. Uh, that is not only unethical, it's a violation to become part of the recruiting process, which shouldn't be confused with, hey, I want to hire you to do my recruiting film, and I will send it to people, um, which is what we did with those players, uh, you guys did with those players, kind of a little side gig. But you, yeah, can't, you yeah. can't get involved in the kids' recruitment. You're there to rep- report on it. Yeah, I mean, back when we were with Rivals, actually, there's a, we were at the Rivals camp, and, and I remember John Talman actually said something that stuck with me in the sense that um, he was talking to the campers there and was trying to kind of go over um, the staff that was there that included us at the time. And he said, uh, you know, our job is not to become part of your recruitment. Our job is to cover your recruitment. Um, and, you know, to answer Wag's question, you'd be surprised how many people that are out there that, do get do become part of the recruitment and do try and squeeze themselves into the middle of a, of a process and you know I guess want to look smart by telling coaches that they uncovered somebody or whatever but you know for the most part uh, I don't um, I think you know I'll chat with other guys in our industry that have more connections than I do you know our guys at the national team and I might share like hey you, you should check this kid out um, and I the other thing is you know through social media, you'd be surprised uh, uh, every now and then at some of the followers that I'll pick up. I mean, there are small town or small uh, program coaches that will follow guys like me and especially our national team. Um, and so they see who you're tweeting at about, you know, they see what games you're going to and that sort of thing. So some of it kind of uh, handles itself, I guess. Um, uh, but no, I mean, it, it's never been, you know, my job to pump up a kid, you know, to, to a college coach or whatever. Um, I might write a story on a guy that I, I really like. Um, and if that helps get his name out there, sure. But, um, no, to, to echo your, your sentiments, Fitz, that, that's not what we're in the business to do. It's just not. Yeah. And it's not uh, to be, go deeper into this, not something I tolerate, you know, it's, we're, we're here to cover it. And even if a kid, 
ask about K-State, you know, you, you say, well, you need to talk to Taylor Brad or your coaches about Exactly. That. Um, we're not here to sell K-State. Uh, that is stepping over the boundaries of, of what we're, we're allowed to do and should do in this industry. Wildcat wants to know this also. In your opinion, what is the most overvalued and undervalued skill or trait on the recruiting trail by most Power 5 schools? I thought that was a good question. It's either a good question or a horrible question because there's no answer. <laughs> but since I'm friends Wag- with Wildcat, I'll expose him to the answer. Yeah, Wags is a smart guy. I know where he's going with this. Um, the the overvalued skill, and I'm going to answer these based on, like, you know, when when I hear, like, why a kid doesn't end up at a certain school, like the reasoning that I might hear, I'm, I'm answering from that perspective. Um, so the overvalued thing, I think, in recruiting is this, this whole thing, measurements, measurables. You know, you'll hear all the time, well, yeah, he doesn't. We don't think he has the frame to grow into, uh, you know, a power five kid or, oh, you know, he, he didn't run fast enough uh, at, at a camp. You know, we timed him too slow. Um, you know, people will rag on the NFL, you know, and used to, they used to rag Al Davis and the Raiders for getting too caught up in the numbers. And, and yeah, you can, but. Uh, I think we're seeing a lot of college teams kind of get too caught up um, in whatever, you know, numbers and measurements and measurables. Um, but to me, that that can get overblown. I, I understand there are times, but, you know, when there's a kid that, you know, does everything that you want him to do, but his shoulders, like, aren't measuring big enough. And therefore, you know, you don't think that his frame will grow. It, you know, it, it it gets to be a little bit too scientific. At times, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think the biggest gift a coach can have at a school such as Kansas State where you're not going to have the um, market-ready five-star guy that can step in and play right away, he's physically ready for college football, which is you know makes you kind of a freak if you ask me. But uh, if you're not able to get those guys, you have to be able to look at someone and say, this is where we're going to end up with this player. Even if he doesn't quite fit, what you know those measurements might be now you can see where they're going to end up and i think uh todd weiner's son is a perfect example todd weiner came yeah. to kansas state as a tight end he was weighed about 240 pounds to i don't know exactly you know he was 230 he was not a big guy but they knew he could get big and he got big and now his son austin comes along and it's like well, the same thing's going to happen. I mean, the 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 similarities in how they look is astonishing. He's yeah. going to be a three hundred pound offensive tackle. I have no doubt about it. Um, let's go back here to Wildcat Pilot um, as we wrap up this first segment here. Who are the top few newcomers you are most excited to see play this fall? And I'll define newcomers as either brand new in the program that might play right away or underclassmen that might start seeing more action than just special teams. Maybe some guys that were in last year's class that we didn't see much of. Hmm. Um, From the 2021 class, and I'm going to answer this, Matt, uh, you know, who knows whether they play or not. I'm just talking about guys over the course of their career. Um, that I'm kind of most excited to see grow. Um, you know, we mentioned Nate Matlack. Uh, everybody knows about you know, Taylor Warner. I, I, I like his ability. Deuce Vaughn is a guy that, you know, stature-wise, people are going to see him, you know, come out on Saturdays and go, you know, who let the the high school kid out onto the field? But his his tape is just electric. Uh, great kid, comes from a great family. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to kind of seeing what he can do um, Whit Mitchum is a guy that, you know, we talk about Austin Weiner. Whit Mitchum is, is similar, you yeah. know, 6'7", 250. But, man, you throw his tape on and you're like, this guy at 300 pounds will be an absolute machine. Um, so he's a guy I'm excited about. And, and you know, I was telling Riley Gates at a, at a K-State camp last year, I said, wait until you see Hadley Panzer. He's going to be at this camp today and wait until you see what he can do um, against guys. Because, you know, he's from Lakin, small town, western Kansas. Uh, I said, you know, he's got the, the typical K-State, you know, offensive line or D-line makeup. You know, he's a talented wrestler with holds all these state accolades, just understands leverage, understands um, balance and all that kind of stuff. And I think Hadley Panzer is a guy that, that could end up, you know, as a center, um, having a really great 
fine career for K-State. And I guess if we go back to 2019, you know, maybe some guys that we didn't see yet last year that, that might have a shot. Everybody's talking about Will Jones. Um, everybody I talked to is talking about how the, the speed that he brings to the table. You know, will he be able to carve out a role as a corner? Probably not, just because you got, you know, A.J. Parker still there. Uh, you know, they're experimenting more with Lance Robinson, Walter Neal's back. I forgot about uh, Walter. So m- maybe Will Jones is more of a guy that we see on special teams, but his speed is phenomenal. I'm uh, still holding out hope on Connor Fox. And maybe, maybe this year he can start to um, crack into that tight end lineup. And uh, one other guy that I think uh, everybody kind of knows about by now um, is Cooper Beebe. Fitz, yeah. you've heard about him. We, I've heard about it. If you haven't heard about Cooper Beebe by this point, um, you've been living under a rock because he is uh, going to start this year. Um, can't, could start at multiple positions when you talk about a guy like Cody White here. I mean, Cooper might be a tackle this year and be a guard from here on out after this fall. Um, but he's that good that Connor Riley is going to find a place for him on the starting offensive line for the next four years. No doubt about it. Yeah, it's one of those situations where uh, if you've got some questions on your offensive line, you take your best guy and put him where you need him. It's probably already him as a Richard freshman. Probably. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Josh Rivas is is you know the guy that comes back with the most experience. Um, but if you want to talk about it, the guy that you know K State has the most most faith in um, as far as uh, potential and ability, I mean, if, if Josh Rivas is one then Cooper BB is 1A or right there at 2 as a redshirt freshman. Well, Wally's answer led to a great question I have for him, but you're going to have to wait through the break because that will come in the second half of this edition of the Powercat Questions podcast sponsored by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. And, folks, that's called a cliffhanger. Stay locked in. The Powercat podcast will be right back. Imagine the softest sheets you've ever felt. Now imagine them getting even softer over time. I'm here to tell you about Bowl & Branch Sheets. In a recent customer survey, 96% replied that Bowl & Branch Sheets get softer with every wash. They're made from the rarest organic cotton and designed to get even softer over time. Try their sheets with a 30-night guarantee plus 15% off your first order with code ODYSSEY. So head to B-O-L-L and branch.com today. Exclusions apply. See site for details. Life as a parent is nonstop. I'm so focused on keeping my family healthy that I barely have time to take care of myself. If this sounds like you, then you need to give Symbiotica a try. Symbiotica is a health and wellness company that empowers individuals to take ownership of their health with high-quality formulas and supplements crafted to boost energy, immunity, gut health, and more. Symbiotica supplements are made with clean, natural ingredients, and they don't contain any toxins or artificial ingredients. Because they were designed for us, busy parents. They're quick and easy to take. Just a daily dose for your energy, immune system, and overall well-being. It's made staying consistent so much easier. And the best part? Symbiotica is having their holiday sale, so now's the perfect time to put your health in the driver's seat. Head to Symbiotica.com for 20% off with code GIFT20. That's C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com with code GIFT20 for 20% off. Your health transformation journey starts now. Symbiotica Natural and Organic Supplements. We now send it back to Fitz in the WTC gig-powered studios. Welcome back to the Powercat Questions podcast. We're sponsored by The Fridge. Get to The Fridge. Love The Fridge. Honor The Fridge with your business. And this segment's brought to you by The High Low, now open in Aggieville. Great pizza, incredible wings, actually, and incredible burgers. Get down to The High Low. Get your fix. They're open. So get in there. Uh, it's a great place. And, uh, Wally, let's get right back into this. Let's not mess around. You mentioned in the last segment uh, going to the camp a, lot, a couple of years ago with Hadley Panzer uh, being imp- mm-hmm. and keep an eye on him. Go look at him. Watch him. How much does not having the camps and the, all the other things that K-State coaches really value, how much not having those is going to impact their ability to recruit this year? It's, it, it hurts K-State big time yeah. because this is a program under Snyder um, and, and under Chris Kleiman that really thrives off those camps. That is their chance to get Western Kansas kids um, or, uh, you know, so kids that you, maybe you, you don't typically get out to see in the fall 
um, because you're busy in, in Florida or Dallas or what have you. Getting those kids in and being able to see them compete against better competition, higher level competition, um, but also all these fringe players. The K State, you know, again wants to see. Let's see, you know, how this kid runs. Let's see this kid that maybe a different position than he typically plays in high school. Camps answer a lot of those questions. Um, you know, you look at the the last year signing class alone. Um, Will Swanson got an offer, was identified by K State at a camp. Uh, signed with K-State. Carver Willis brought to a camp, identified, you know, evaluated at that camp without pads, mind you, offered at the camp, committed. Sam Shields was a camp guy, but obviously being from Manhattan, they knew about him. Um, uh, Taylor Warner was a camp guy that they were able to get um, after seeing him perform at a camp. Cody Stuffelbein was a camp guy. Uh, I'm still going down the list. Hadley Panzer was a camp guy. Uh, Felix Anu DK. Uh, was also a camp guy. Unbelievable. So I don't know how many I just rattled off, six, maybe seven guys that they w- were all either offered or identified, participated in a camp. And not only does it, is it for those, the immediate recruiting class, but Fitz, they do, they've done a really good job under Coach Snyder and Chris Kleiman last year uh, of, you know, they're, they're younger guys that come to those camps too, um, that they can kind of get a first look on. Um, so you think about some guys that, might have come this year had there been camps. You know, they, they offered uh, uh, the Randall kid that's a freshman out of Wichita Heights. He probably could have come, and they could have kind of begun that relationship and, you know, seen him against older competition. So y- y- you can begin building those relationships and getting early evaluations on guys at camps as well. Uh, not having camps is a killer. It, it, there's no there's no way around it. And the interesting thing, Fitz, that I heard from – Taylor Bratt in an interview that he did a couple weeks now uh, back, and we actually featured some excerpts uh, on our site from that interview, was apparently uh, Coach Bratt was, uh, has, uh, has talked to Coach Kleiman, and Coach Kleiman is actually pushing an idea whether or not you know there's any traction behind it. Um, but it's an interesting concept of maybe pushing camps into the winter. Um, if you can't have a summer camp, um, maybe you have camps in an indoor facilities in the winter, um, and whether that's guys that still aren't committed, um, that are seniors, that are looking to maybe you know give it a final go, maybe they are invited, uh, or you get the younger guys um, that again couldn't come out during the summer, could maybe come in the winter. Uh, you know whether that's doable, I, who knows? Um, but it's an interesting concept. You know the process of unearthing the missed recruit doesn't happen exclusively by watching video. You can only see so much on video, and they're usually highlights. If you have complete game tapes, that gives you a lot more information. It actually happens when you get them physically in front of you in a camp, and not having that really does kind of handcuff K-State a little bit, and it's unfortunate, but uh, just the way it is. You know, It's not like one of those situations where you're bringing the five-star, four-star player into your camp, and you know they're really good, but now you get them in front of you where you can offer them in person and be really impressive to them. You're getting three sky, three star guys, or maybe even two star on rank guys in front of you that you find in person to be really special, and that's what K State has done under well, and, and, and now climbing. And fits beyond that, something else that just came to mind that's really important about camps is these coaches get to coach them as if they were, you know, on the roster already, yeah. and you can get a feel of okay, who's going to take my coaching demeanor? <laughs> Who, you know, who's who's got the thick skin and tough enough and and wants to to listen, and you know, who's who's just not you know going to fit well with this style of coaching, and you can figure that out literally from one day of camp. Let's move on to another one from Wagcat. I didn't realize he jumped from page one to page two of the questions because he was prolific. Uh, I love this question, though. What was your biggest miss? Some recruit you thought was destined for college success, K-State or not, that just didn't pan out? Uh, okay, so a guy that didn't pan out that I thought, um, you know, had some had some ability, uh, I I admit that I was all in on Dalvin Hormack. Um, when you win the Simone Award twice, um, I know stature-wise, you know he he you know wasn't the biggest guy, but um, the things that I watched him do on Friday night was special. And I knew in an in an offense like Coach Snyder's, I thought, okay, you know this is the type of running back that could really go on 
to have a, a, a nice career, and he did. I mean, he he had a fine career, but it wasn't maybe to the hype that I built him up to be and that others built him up to be. Um, there was another kid, and this was, uh, you know, not by his own, you know, misfortune or anything. Uh, A.J. Harris um, was a guy from Blue Valley High School that uh, I – worked hard to get an invite to a rivals camp back in, I think 2013. Um, and Fitz, he damn near won the MVP award as the right. offensive lineman, uh, committed to Missouri. And unfortunately for him, he just get, got bit by the injury bug, um, was kind of always flirting with a starting job or on the two deep, but then would get nicked up somewhere along the way. And it just didn't happen. Um, also I would throw in biggest miss guys that I didn't think would be as good as they ended up being. Uh, I'll be honest, I, I didn't know if Josh Rebus would be as good as he's been at K-State when I saw him. Uh, I thought there were some question marks about his mobility, um, and he's proven me wrong. So, you know, job well done to Josh Rebus. And then the biggest miss, uh, and actually I feel better about admitting this because I've talked to high school coaches in the area that say, you know, actually I was on the, in the same boat with you, is Isaiah Simmons. Um, <laughs> I, I watched him. I watched him as a senior, um, and I watched him against Blue Valley. Uh, I, I talked to him a few times when he was a high school senior. Um, I think he's a nice kid, but he was not interested in K-State. Um, that tone led me to believe that uh, you know his, his, short, his short responses kind of made me think, okay, well, maybe he's, there's an attitude here. Uh, kind of watched him loaf a little bit in their playoff loss that ended his, his high school campaign. I just expected him to pop out a little bit more, and he didn't. Uh, and I kind of went with that one game impression and ran with it. And yikes, <laughs> how, how wrong was I? Yeah, I saw him, and I think you were there too, at, at some camp, and he didn't do much. It was a rivals camp. Yeah. He just kind of yeah. sat out most of the stuff, and he didn't look like a linebacker. He didn't seem interested. He seemed aloof. He he wasn't taking it seriously. And I'm like, well, that's that's pretty much the prescription for a guy that doesn't go anywhere. But maybe Brent Venables was exactly what he needed because you don't <laughs> yeah. get away with that with Brent Venables at Clemson. He's going to chew you up. Um, and, boy, he turned out to be pretty good. He's, he was okay. He was an okay football player. <laughs> Let's just say that. Um, but, yeah, that's uh, – you know. and I wonder – and this is always a question you have to answer. Is there going to be a day when K-State can cycle back through, build it back up, and maybe get those kids because uh, – the case the state of Kansas doesn't produce enough players to stock one Division One football program. You know, let's just put that on the yeah. table. And the, and there's there's one and a half in the state. You know, there's two, and it's uh, it's really impossible to build off of just Kansas kids. But it gets difficult when you don't even get a sniff on a guy like Isaiah Simmons that doesn't want anything to do with you, and that we can go down the list of all those players that have leaked out to other places. I mean, and uh, they just don't really have an interest. And maybe it was Coach Snyder's style, or maybe it's just I don't want to be playing football in Kansas anymore. I want to go to a bigger stage. I'm not sure, but Kansas got to, Kansas State's got to solve that. They got to we, they got to get back to getting some of those kids. Yeah, yeah. No doubt about it. Let's see. Next question from Wagcat. Um, uh, what is your biggest win for K-State? So I'm going to read a guy locally or nationally that you just knew was going to be big time and was. Um, I think the, the, the one that really comes to mind that I, I remember after watching him work out, I just thought there's no way that this kid can't be good. I mean, there's just no way uh, was Jordan Willis. Um, I was I was all in on that one <laughs> from the get go. Uh, just the way he trained, his mental mindset, his maturity for a kid that age yeah. um, it was just through the roof. Um, maybe it wasn't as impactful right away, but I mean, we saw by the time he was a senior, whoa, this kid is legit. Um, I was always big on Scott Franz. Uh, once I was able to see him in person, uh, the way he moved for his size. Uh, I always liked Scott. Um, Kyle Ball was a guy that I just kind of had some faith in that would mature into something at K-State. Um, and here's a guy that maybe you forgot about, Fitz, but I remember you and I talking about him on the way back from St. Louis going, you know, fans might kind of put their nose up to, to this uh, commitment, the scholarship. But after we watched Winston Dimmel yeah. in St. Louis, we said, this kid's got some ability here. <laughs> um 
And so I think we were both right on Winston Dimmel. And then um, and as far as wins that, you know, where I'm, I can tout that I was correct on guys that maybe were over-recruited, um, guys that were Kansas State fans were going, why aren't we recruiting this kid? You know, he's a four-star. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a kid named Miles Emery from Blue Valley North um, that I can't remember how many times I had to address his name on, you know, why K-State's not after him. Um, and turns out he ended up at Butler County Community College, and I'm not even sure he's really done a whole lot there. Um, and we got into some office arguments, if I remember, over the name quarterback Jonathan Banks. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and I was never high on Jonathan Banks as a player either. I just didn't think that he uh, fit the mold for K-State, and lo and behold, uh, ended up having a fine career at Tulane, but he wasn't the guy for K-State. I was right on that one. Yeah, yeah. Um... He was probably he ended up probably exactly where he needed to be was a you know group of six type player that could go stir the pot at a smaller program and that ended up being where he needed to be. Yeah. Contra Cat asks uh, kind of non player specific questions when you when you go to a game let's say you're going to a high profile game that you know both teams have lots of talent on what do you gravitate towards watching offensive skill defensive skill line play versus backfield. You know those type of things. What what catches your eye about a player that jumps out? Uh, well, I mean, at the high school level, you know, anybody that's got size and speed, you know, is is easy to identify. Um, so you you can catch the skill players by, by accident, basically. Uh, you know, those guys those guys pop if they're if they're good enough. I have to kind of force myself to watch the trenches more um, because you know, unless you're you know six nine and three hundred thirty pounds, I mean, you you those are the guys that, uh, that that will stand out from an offensive or defensive line perspective. But there are other guys that have a lot of talent there, but you've got to really key in on, on make yourself watch those guys. Um, me personally, I, I love to watch uh, defensive backs. Um, again, wide receivers and running backs are easy to identify. So for me, it's always fun to kind of find the best offensive player uh, on the field and then see who kind of matches up with them on defense. Cause that's usually going to be a guy that that opposing coaching staff holds in high regard um, as an athlete. Yeah. Um, so I, it's, it's natural for me to kind of gravitate to the secondary. Uh, and then, like I said, I, I have to kind of force myself um, to keep an eye on, on the, the trenches. Cause um, there are a lot of good linemen in this area that you you'll miss if you're just busy watching running backs and quarterbacks and receivers. Yeah, that's a good point to, to keep an eye on who the opposing coaches want to put on the star player. It's because uh, uh, if you're a high school coach, you, you're not going to let them pick that matchup because you can get exposed exactly. pretty quickly. Uh, I was always amazed watching a video with my dad, who was an old football coach and did scouting for Salina Central still for a very long time. Uh, how he could just pick out linemen, offensive linemen in particular, that look, this whole play worked because of number seventy-two. Go back and let's go back and look at him. I'm like, holy cow! He he would see like you and I, how you and I see a skill player. He would see all that with uh, with mm-hmm. the linemen. It was just amazing to watch. Mm-hmm. Uh, me cat, which I think probably is a mechanical engineer cat fourteen. What's your opinion on? Uh, this kind of gets off of recruiting specific, but what's your opinion on college teams with multiple multiple alternate uniforms? Should K State do more? If more, what would you like to see? Does it really have an impact in recruiting? I guess. Yes, it's crazy. 100%. It does. It does. Uh, and I think the the best proof of that pudding is the minute that K State had an all white uniform. Um, or the cat script helmet, or even just the white power cat helmet that they wore like in the Liberty Bowl. Um, when recruits visit, you never see them in the primary uniform anymore. Right. I mean, when they have their photos taken that they want to post on social media, they all want the all white. Uh, uh, you know, if K-State had, uh, I don't want to say all purple, but if they had a black uniform, they would be in black. You know, if they had any sort of as many combinations as K-State wants to come out with, I don't think you have to go to Oregon level by any means. Um, but, you know, TCU's done a nice job over the years of having, you know, a couple, couple different things each year um, that they can sprinkle into the mix. Um, even Oklahoma State, I think, does a good job, and they've got a ton. Maybe you don't need that many alternates, but they do a great job of sprinkling in retro looks and, uh, you know, kind of, 
exotic, you know, new age looks and even just different color combinations of their primary design. It it's not hard. I mean, it, it really isn't. And I know K State is is working to add more of that to their, you know, closet, their wardrobe. Uh, but it also takes time, you know, mm-hmm. and that's probably the thing that I get frustrated at. I have to remind myself, and I know fans probably don't know all the the inner workings, but I'm, I'm sure if we were ever able to sit down with Al Serbi, who is the equipment manager for K-State, he'd probably tell us uh, and reiterate that, you know, there are contracts and discussions and things with Nike, and then it's got to go through climbing. And, I mean, there's there's a process to, to get a lot of those things, but I know K-State's working towards it, and it's a good thing because recruits love it. The best evidence I saw, and we certainly witnessed a lot of it with the alternates that Chris Kleiman had, when Bill Snyder finally did the camo helmet, which really wasn't that radical, it was just a white helmet with some camo on it, you know, And but all the recruits wanted that helmet. That's what they wanted to have on. I'm like, well, that pretty much shows you that's not even a great alternate helmet, and that's still what the kids want to be seen in. It was very well. Since I remember, I remember the, and maybe you do too. This will, you know, kind of refresh things a little bit. But there was a uh, there was a senior day game against Iowa State, and I want to say it might have been uh, John Hubert's senior year, Colin Klein's senior year ish. Um, anyway, so what, what are we looking at? Twenty thirteen ish. Um, where Coach Snyder allowed the team, for whatever reason, they'd just been asking, and he let them wear black socks. Black socks. That's all they wanted. And they and had the a team riot. flipped out. They flipped out. They thought it was the greatest thing on earth. And all it was was black socks. So, uh, yeah, kids care about that kind of stuff. It's crazy. I mean, it, you know, it. I guess when you're never allowed to have sweets as a kid, Jello is awfully good. You know, there you it's, go. it's exactly what it kind of was. Snare Cat 3, uh, how has your coverage routine changed with this new coaching staff? And which is really, they've really revamped the recruiting approach. Compare your routine before to what it is now. Did life get easier or busier? Busier. Yeah, a lot. A lot. <laughs> a lot. A lot busier. Uh, so for folks that don't know, I mean, Go Power Cat is my technically, a, you know, air quotes, part time job right. uh, i have a full-time job in kansas city i've got you know a 18 month old at home that i am going home to every day and waking up with every morning uh so you know on top of all of those things that are going on now the, at the rate that this staff is offering kids at the rate that this staff communicates with kids you have to be on the ball constantly to keep up with the names keeping up with who the names are that they find to be priorities um so and, and it from a content standpoint, that's why you're seeing me roll out with things like the offer blitz. Um, with Coach Snyder, you never, you, you know, an offer blitz, for those that haven't seen that type of content that we've put out on the website, um, it will recap all of the new offers within, you know, a week or two weeks span. Uh, with Coach Snyder, you might, in over the course of three months, have three new offers. <laughs> you know, I mean, with this staff, over the course of three weeks, you might have 30 new offers. Yep. Um, so it's a lot busier, and it, it just takes a lot more uh, research, homework, babysitting um, to just kind of keep up with who's hearing from coaches the most, um, where are they spending time, uh, you know, who they're offering. And if you miss a couple days or a weekend, uh, you, you'll be in a tailspin for a while trying to get, trying to get back into, into the swing of things. You know, football recruiting under Bill Snyder was a part-time job. It really was. And yeah, yeah. now it's closer to full-time. So we're when Riley Gates was with us, he was kind of pitching in. Mm-hmm. You know, you you can't catch everything. And now Ryan Gilbert's going to get into that eventually. Zach's helping a little bit. Uh, but um, it's it's incredible. It's, it's just – it's so different now to have – um, the productivity and openness, the change in the atmosphere, because it's it's not like they're open with us. They're open on the Internet. I mean, now that they can retweet right. stuff, the information's all out there. You just got to go scoop it up. It's like gold is laying in the fields. You don't even have to dig for it at times. You just go. Yeah, it's becoming it it's becoming a it's becoming a team effort by necessity. You know, um, whether you want people helping you or not, uh, I, I definitely understand now I need help. <laughs> um, you know, so it, it, it's be going to become 
Um, if it hasn't already, it's definitely moving towards becoming more of a team effort where you'll see uh, people beyond just my name posting football recruiting stuff because that's the way it has to be. Exactly. Wildcat Pilot 88 again, what are some of the things the KSU staff is doing really well? And is there anything you can see that they need to improve on in terms of recruiting? Um, as far as what they're doing well, I just I like that they're being consistent with guys. Um, I like that, that they're communicating regularly with uh, guys that have offers as well as guys that don't. Um, they're not putting all their stock in you know one barrel. They're, they're kind of sprinkling it out. At the same time, maybe something that they that they need to do better. Um, uh, this is a touchy subject here. You know, you've got to be politically correct here. Um, <clears throat> I wonder. I do wonder at times maybe if uh, if they should zone in a little bit more. Um, you know, maybe maybe prioritize someone. Uh, more than others uh, before you start to kind of make moves uh, in an area. And I'll give an example. Like, so with Seth Malcolm that ended up committing to Nebraska, I mean, K-State made it very clear he was the linebacker they wanted for a very, very long time. And, yes, they didn't get him. Um, but I, I think there are, are other positions where maybe they're kind of too spread out, um, where they, they don't have that kind of central focus, um, at least from my vantage point, which is – you know, very naive without being inside the near on a daily basis. Who am I to talk? But at the same time, from an outside looking in, I think there are certain areas that maybe it'd be nice to just see them pressure a little bit more. Right. Um, you know, we, we hear stories about other coaching staffs that, um, and, and again, sometimes that pressure can backfire uh, and you can scare kids off or it'll get around that, oh, that coaching staff really puts pressure on you um, to commit. And so there's a fine line to do it, but I think at times you wish that K-State would put a little bit more pressure on kids. And and explain, there's different types of offers. There's offers to be offered, and then there's offers. We, you want to commit yeah. today. And a lot, of, yeah. a lot of the offers aren't, we're not ready to take your commitment, but we're very interested. And, you know, this might be an offer offer in the future. It's kind of nuanced and and but for a kid sometimes they see all these offers at their position group and they don't feel valued when they they might be the valued guy and it's just kind of a, it just happens that's exactly uh wtdd 2001 brings its full circle and brings us to a conclusion here the in-state class of 2020 and 19 were exceptional but 21 seems to be a little bit weak in the metro area particularly is 22 and 23 looking strong or weak for prospects? Uh, I think 2021 isn't that bad. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I really don't think it is. I've, I've mentioned this on our on our message boards before that um, is, is it as strong as 2020 and 2019? Um, probably not. But as you heard me say at the very beginning, those were probably two of the strongest classes that Kansas have had since I've started covering recruiting. And I think guys that are even older than me would tell you that it's a strong recruiting class as they've seen you know, the end of the 90s. I mean, a really, really strong core. But uh, I do think 2022 and 2023 are going to be um, strong as far as, you know, some of the, the top-tier guys. Um, you know, 2023, you're already looking at two running backs down in the Wichita area, uh, the Randall Jr., um, John Randall Jr., uh, that K-State has already offered at Wichita Heights is a 2023 prospect. There's also... Uh, uh, player, the, his name is escaping me. His dad actually played at K-State. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's, he will be a running back at Derby this year, 2023 prospect. Um, give me a minute and I'll pull him up. But anyway, those two guys for 2023 um, are going to be exceptional players. Uh, and I would certainly keep an eye on those two guys. Um, the Oh, Dylan Edwards. Is Leon Edwards' son? That's oh, if wow. you remember Leon Edwards. Wow, um, is, he, is he a small person too? He's he's lightning in a bottle, yep. <laughs> and I mean he is really quick. I mean, there's already murmurs of um, is this kid with with a couple years and a little bit more weight training? Are we looking at like the number one kid in the state? I mean, that's the type of player that I think Dylan Edwards could be, and he's barely taken you know many varsity snaps at Derby. 
Um, so he's a guy to watch. Uh, Derby's also got a ton of 2022 offensive linemen that are really good. Um, but, you know, you look at 2022 uh, in Kansas City, um, Dominique Orange at North Kansas City is a guy that is probably going to be a four-star kid, could maybe – maybe be a five-star kid in time. Um, he's already got a Georgia offer, Texas A&M, Nebraska, K-State. K-State's been on him for a long time. Um, he's a guy that stands out in my mind that will be up there um, from the Kansas City Metro in 2022. Um, so, again, off the top of my head, I can't think of everybody, but I do think that you know, if you want to look at like from a star perspective, a rankings perspective, yeah, 2022 and 23 are probably going to have maybe some higher profile kids than what we're seeing in 2021. But I don't think um, that that makes 2021 bad. I just think 2021 is, is more of a class that's built on long-term potential as opposed to these more immediate um, impact guys. Very good, Wally. Thank you very much for your time. I know you're busy. This was great, man. Um, and Thank you. You can follow him at gopowercat.com. He's been doing it a long time uh, and his knowledge of – the K-State recruiting base and the players in the Kansas City metro area in particular is obvious, but he also knows the state quite well, and it comes from years of having contacts. Wally, take care of yourself. Thank you much, and that'll do it for this edition of the Powercat Questions podcast. We'll be back next week with your questions for me, Zach, and, and Gills as we return to the format, and we might even have a guest on this week's Overtime podcast. Stay tuned for that. You've been listening to the Power Cat Questions podcast presented by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. Power Cat Podcast, all rights reserved, gopowercat.com and Spirit Street Publishing. With Blue Link Plus, you can access your Hyundai Tucson Limited remotely. Doors unlocked, temperature set, lost car found. There it is. Get complimentary class leading Blue Link Plus. Call 562-314-4603 for complete details.